Good evening. It's a great pity about the Mars Observer spacecraft. Should you to go round and round Mars and map the planet in greater detail than ever before. But sadly, we've lost contact with it, and I'm afraid we are never again in contact now. There's been some onboard fault, and I suspect that Mars Observer is now going round the sun, and we're going on doing that in the indefinite future. Well, you can't win them all. It's a very complex probe indeed. This is the first American failure with Mars for a long time, and there will be other Mars probes. When I was a boy, that's a long time ago now I know, we had to depend entirely upon visible light coming from the sky. Then, in the early 1930s, Carl Jansky in America built an improvised radio aerial and picked up radio waves that he subsequently found to come from the Milky Way. And that was the real start of radio astronomy. Later in the 1930s, Groot Rieber built a dish, the first intentional radio telescope. And since then, of course, we had these great dishes, such as the Lovell Telescope at Joshua Bank in Cheshire. Now, not all radio telescopes are dishes, far from it, but they all have the same function, to collect and analyze the radio waves coming from space. They don't, of course, produce a visible picture in the same way that an optical telescope does, but they can give us information we could never get in any other way. Now, remember, visible light is only a very small part of the total range of wavelengths, or electromagnetic spectrum. On the short wave end, we have gamma rays, then X-rays, then ultraviolet, then visible light from violet through to red, then infrared, microwaves, and finally radio waves. And it's these radio waves we collect with radio telescopes. Obviously, the bigger your radio telescope, the more powerful and the more sensitive it is. And ideally, we'd like a radio telescope about the size of the British Isles. And quite clearly, you can't have that. So we have to use various dodges, one of which is now called Merlin. At this stage, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Richard Davis at George Royal Bank. Welcome to the sky at night, Richard. Now, in mythology, Merlin was a wizard. What is Merlin now? What does it stand for? Merlin stands for Multi-Element Radio-Linked Interferometer Network. In other words, several dishes. Now, what can several dishes do that one dish can't do on its own? Well, our system consists of seven radio telescopes, all linked through to the University of Manchester's Jodrell Bank in Cheshire. And <clears throat> we can build up signals as if we had a giant telescope, 220 kilometers in diameter. Now, why we want to do this, imagine yourself with an optical telescope just 10 centimeters in diameter here. If we were to scale that in wavelength, to a radio wave, we would need an instrument of roughly 10 kilometers in diameter. Yeah, uh, our instrument, uh, Merlin, has the same sort of resolution as the Hubble Space Telescope. We can see the positions of the telescopes uh, in our country, uh, the northerly one there at Tabley, Jodrell Bank, and the southerly one at Defford. And as the Earth rotates, we get this signal as if we had this dish drawn here in, in, a, in dotted form. We've recently added an extra telescope at Cambridge uh, which, when we draw our circle, we see gives us a 220-kilometer um, diameter telescope. We can have a look at this telescope um, now in construction. It was finished at the beginning of 1990, and uh, the crane here picking the uh, bowl up in one piece, 150-ton lift, uh, moves it round and puts it on the mount in something like about half an hour. And here's the finished telescope. Um, the optics of it were designed by ourselves, uh, Jodrell Bank. Uh, it's a system rather like the Hubble Space Telescope, a twin mirror system. Uh, the structural engineering was done by MAN um, of Germany. Now let us have a look to see if we can see how we can use our country as a radio telescope. Yeah. Here's Jodrell Bank in Cambridge. Now imagine viewing this from space. Uh, during the day, the two dishes will appear to rotate around each other because of the Earth rotation. And through the 24-hour period, we get this um, complete circle in, the, in this way. And another pair of telescopes somewhere else in the country will form another circle, which in the computer we can move to the center. And so you see, in a way, we're building up the signals as if we had this um, giant radio telescope. Now, we haven't actually got all of the spacings. You can see there are some missing spacings there. So let's try and make an image of a point source. What would we actually get with our Merlin system? And this is the sort of thing that we have to contend with. It looks a bit of a mess, yeah. and you can see the sort of elliptical-like structure that's in the image there. This is how a point source would appear. The beauty is, though, that we can 
we are absolutely sure precisely what this sort of distortion looks like. So now let's make a picture of Cygnus A, which is a well-known double radio source, and you can see that sort of pattern all over the place. We can use computers to do a process called deconvolution or clean to remove that sort of structure from the image, and here we have the beautiful cleaned image of Cygnus A, which we would have achieved had we a giant telescope 220 kilometers in diameter. Well, Cygnus A, of course, is a galaxy. And when we talk about radio sources, we're usually thinking of oh, galaxies, quasars, pulsars, and things like that. And really bright stars, such as Sirius, Vega, and Weigel, they don't send out detectable radio waves. But I gather you are particularly interested in some particular kinds of stars, notably supernova remnants, the Crab Nebula, for example. The remnants of the stars seem to blow up way back in 1054, although, of course, actually 6,000 light years away, so it's actual outbursts took place in prehistoric times. But there are other kinds of stars, too, that I know you're interested in, particularly in binary systems. A binary being a star made up of two components going around their common center of gravity, rather like the two bells of a dumbbell going around their adjoining bar. Why are you so interested, from a radio point of view, in binaries? Well, it turns out that the binary systems are very rich in producing radio waves. Let's have a look at the sort of object we're talking about. Mostly, we require one of the stars to be a white dwarf. This is a collapsed star. It's the end of the life of a star like our own sun. It's a whole solar mass in that little white dot there, uh, something like a million times um, solar density with a temperature of about 30,000 degrees. Its uh, other star there is an ordinary main sequence star like our own sun, and these two are orbiting each other every, every few hours or so. And what happens is the white dwarf has such an intense gravitational field that it starts to pull off uh, mass from the uh, secondary star through what is called the inner Lagrangian point, and this mass will move across to the white dwarf. It doesn't land directly on the surface of the white dwarf because of its angular momentum. It forms an accretion disk as it moves uh, nearby. There we see the accretion disk um, for forming in that sort of way. Now, it's this mass exchange from one star to the other onto the white dwarf, which is the crucial thing for the um, radio mission. What happens is two possible things. We get a hot nebula ionization um, caused by the uh, ultraviolet radiation, giving us what we call free-free emission. Uh, another possibility um, is an explosion. Let's uh, have a look now, a close-in look at the uh, accretion disk. It's possible for that accretion disk of, with time to become unstable and to fall over rather like a pyramid standing on its point and fall onto the white dwarf. The result of this is an enormous uh, thermonuclear explosion and this is actually what we mean by a nova itself. More about that uh, later on. Well, there are other kinds of binaries too. Those curious stars called symbiotic stars and they, I gather, are of great interest to radio astronomers. Yes, yeah, symbiotic stars, their name comes from symbiosis. Um, we find in their spectra a hot and a cool component. And what we now know is that's precisely what there are actually two stars there. They are a binary system again. And let's have a look at our picture of that. In this case, we still have a white dwarf, but the sister star uh, is a red giant. And so the scale of this is something like 100 times uh, the size of the previous uh, object that we're looking at because of the size of the, of the red giant. Now we get mass ex expanding from the surface, moving across to the white dwarf again, which will again form an accretion disk. But at the same time, we also have a wind um, from the surface of the red giant. So the whole area around this region is full of gas from the red giant. And once we start powering up the white dwarf, we also have a wind uh, a hot wind from the, uh, from the white dwarf and a cool wind from the red giant. And this beautiful uh, artist's impression uh, yeah. showing the two winds actually um, interacting with each other. Well, let's have a look at two examples of what these things can do in the radio. Take, for example, AG Pegasus. This is a Merlin image which shows a beautiful ring or shell um, with the star in the middle and enhanced hot spots. This is changing with time slowly. Um, and we measure a temperature of something like 10,000 degrees. It's the sort of temperature we would imagine. But they can also do very strange things. Let's have a look at RS Ophiuchi. This thing exploded, and it's anything but a, a shell. Uh, it's anything. It looks like twin jets. And we're measuring a temperature here of 100 million degrees. Bearing in mind, of course, that these pictures are beautifully coloured, but these are false colours. They don't, wouldn't actually see that in the sky. Indeed. Well, a little while ago, I mentioned the Crab Nebula, that famous, um, famous supernova remnant, 
which is, uh, I suppose, one of the most fascinating things in the entire sky. And that involved the total destruction of a very massive star. But we do get ordinary novae as well. And they're, they're violent enough, but not so violent as that. And we've just had a very good example, Nova Cygni 1992. Well, what exactly happens in an ordinary novae explosion? Well, we go back to the first case where the sister star in the binary system is a conventional star like our own sun, a main sequence star. And with time, we think every few thousand years, the accretion disk uh, becomes unstable and the mass falls on the white dwarf and we get this um, enormous explosion. Here we can see a picture of the sky taken in 1952 of this region uh, from the Palomar Sky Survey. And at the time of the Nova, Martin Mobley, one of our uh, amateurs, uh, using his 12-inch reflector, took a photograph of the same region, and the nova is clearly visible. It's fourth magnitude. It is actually the brightest nova we've had in the northern hemisphere for the, the last 10 years. With the naked eye and with an ordinary telescope, Nova Cygni looked just like an ordinary star, but in the radio wavelengths, of course, it wasn't. Now, what did Merlin tell you about Nova Cygni? Well, we pointed our Merlin instruments, as you can see in the uh, next picture, at the region of Nova Cygni, given the best position that we had. And you can see all these dots, which are just noise uh, from the radio receiver, but there is one significant uh, region, just two arc seconds south and two arc seconds to the, the right of the, uh, of the center of the image there. You can see the little white, little white mark. The cross uh, indicated here shows the position that we pointed uh, Merlin. It's a very small image, only seven arc seconds by seven arc seconds, but we appear to be about two arc seconds off. A bit worrying. So we looked at the Palomar Sky Survey and found a position of the nearest star to the Nova, and that's indicated by the second cross, and you can see, again, we're, we're, we're not in the right position. So at that point, we contacted our colleagues at the Royal Greenwich Observatory and used the Carlsberg a meridian transit circle on La Palma to measure a very accurate optical position, which you can now see indicated by the little green cross, uh, which you can see is spot on. And we were overjoyed. That, uh, clearly, we measured the correct object, and we were right to 0.05 um, of, of an arc second. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look now at the development of the Nova with time. This graph um, is going to show us the visible uh, magnitude. This is actually the visible magnitude of uh, Nova Cygni, you see the time scale there is 0 to 100 days. It does reach its peak of about fourth magnitude, you see on the left-hand side there, just a few days um, after the outburst. Now let us replot that same optical data on a different time scale, one to five years. You'll see why in a moment. And you'll see that that optical light curve is collapsed down uh, in, into the bottom left-hand corner. What we're now going to draw on is what we think the radio development what the radio flux of this ANOVA will be with time onto the same graph. And the reason we're doing that is to show the difference in time scales between the optical event, which is indicated uh, by the white curve, and the radio, which is indicated um, by the red curve, which reaches, we expect to reach a peak, or did reach a peak after one year, but it, we expect to fade away over a time scale of about five years. Now, the reason for showing this um, is up to now, um, Novi have only really been resolved right at the very end yes. of the light curve yes. when they've expanded big enough. Merlin, with its enhanced resolution, has the ability to uh, resolve a Nova right through the entire development of the light curve. And so let's have a look in more detail. This is the same image of the Nova, uh, although displayed now centered at the correct position given by the Carlsberg. And again, in false color, of course. And again, in, yes, all of these images are in false color. Uh, and now another observation a month later, and the sort of linear structure you saw in the previous image in the north-south direction seems, if anything, to have shrunk and an extension in the east-west direction. Very strange behavior. Uh, another, an observation another month later. Uh, up to now, we're measuring temperatures of about 10,000 degrees, which is what we think we should measure, what we're expecting. Uh, but we are seeing this linear structure develop. Uh, it's getting hotter now. And in the next um, picture, a ring-like structure. And to our great amazement, we're measuring temperatures up to 100,000 Kelvin. The, the reason this is so exciting, this 100,000 Kelvin, is it's impossible to achieve that by shining light onto gas. Uh, if, if, it's, if gas, there's a natural thermostat in gas. If it's uh, cooler than 10,000, um, it, it, it doesn't radiate. If it's hotter than 10,000, it radiates faster than shine light on. So we think this is evidence that uh, the energy is coming directly from the thermonuclear explosion itself. What we can do now is have a look at um, these images displayed as a video. Uh, again, we see this development 
the com collapse in the north-south direction, expansion in the east-west, um, and now the north-south extension starts to redevelop. And at the same time, we're seeing an increase in brightness temperature, an expansion, and a further increase in brightness temperature to this uh, remarkable 100,000 degrees. And now the development moves to more, more towards what a theoretician would expect, yes. a nova shell. Uh, it starts to grow a hole uh, in the center. And just when you think it's starting to look like you would imagine it to do so, uh, it, uh, it develops these two um, lobes, these two bright spots of emission in an east-west direction. And really, uh, the, the total interpretation of this is going to take us um, a long time. Well, novae themselves, uh, thermonuclear uh, processes are terrible here, but the nova is probably very important to us because it's where the elements, particularly carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, are synthesized. Well, this is the first time that a nova has been studied in this amount of detail, and Merlin's clearly doing outstanding work. Now, is it the only equipment of its kind, or are there other small Merlins here and there? Well, in the sense of the instrument being connected together by radio link, it is unique, and I think it probably will be for, for as far as I can see. Uh, in terms of instruments of this sort of resolution, at the moment, yes, it's still, it is still unique, uh, although the Australians are hoping to build an instrument of this sort of resolution in the future. Here we can see the Australia telescope, which is actually up and running, although this is a low-resolution instrument. You can see the telescopes are actually fairly close together. There are plans afoot, though. Here we can see a map of Australia, um, to combine together signals of these different telescopes that you see here, although not by radio link, uh, by a tape recorder uh, technique. And here is one of the dishes, uh, a famous old dish, but will be included in, the, in this array. Uh, and we wish the Australians all luck in uh, getting this system going. Yeah, that's the Parks dish. We've been, we've been there with us guy at night. And clearly there are tremendous developments in radio astronomy. I wonder what's going to happen next. I mean, how big can you make a radio telescope? Is there any actual limit, do you think? Well, we can expand around the Earth, but I think, uh, and indeed there are developments in that direction, but I think from the Merlin point of view, the most important thing is now sensitivity. The Cambridge telescope has helped us with resolution and sensitivity because it's a big dish and it multiplies its signal by all the other telescopes, making them all more powerful. And clearly a way forward would be to improve the giant Lovell telescope at, at Jodrell Bank. We think we can improve its performance by something like a factor of 10, which would ha add a complete new dimension to uh, the Merlin machine. And so we are looking into this very seriously, and th these are our forward plans. It's amazing, isn't it? Only 60 years since radio astronomy really began. Look how far we've come since then. Richard, thank you very much. You. Yes, we've come certainly a very long way since the time of Jansky and Reba. And although radio astronomy is a very young science, it has already become of fundamental importance. And without radio investigations, we will know a great deal less about the universe than we actually do. But when I come back next month, I'm going to talk about something entirely different. I'm going to be joined by Dr. Fred Watson, and we're going to talk about another new technique, fiber optics, how they are used in modern astronomy. And before I go, don't forget, if you want the very latest information, then dial our information line, 0891 800 330, or of course, dial CFAX page 685. And so, until next month, good night.